Um, one of the teachers at another school, what she does is when she does math journals, she'll take some and then she'll um, copy and paste. She'll take pictures on her document camera and she'll cut and she'll paste and she'll put them up and she'll use that as the next day's lesson or discussion. Because if she's doing her math journals and she finds, oh my gosh, when she's sorting through her math journals and she finds that the pile of, they're not getting it, she's like, I've got to go back because the majority aren't getting it. So she'll pick a lot of those common misconceptions that they're having. She'll put them up on the smart board and then they'll talk about it and they'll have like a little discussion. And you would be surprised how many little misconceptions can be fixed just by having a quick discussion. And then there's no names and it works out really well. Are you suggesting that it's better to use math journals at the end of your lesson to check for learning from that that lesson? Or is it okay to use it also at the beginning of a lesson for like more foundational learning and just bigger concepts? Whatever works best for you. Like as long, I would say, I would say beginning, during, after, whenever, whenever you want to do it. It doesn't always have to be, um, what I've done too, Travis, is if I'm into January teaching um, grade five more on division, well, we still have to go back and keep hitting some of those outcomes that we've already taught and going back and spiraling. So I'll put a number, I'll put a question up there about SS5 and SS6, tell me what you know about this shape. You know, and use you know, seeing if they're using the words parallel, perpendicular, intersecting, and things like that. So you can use it to go back and see if they're still understanding those concepts that have previously been taught. It doesn't necessarily have to follow the, inst the instruction of what you're teaching per se. Mm -hmm. yeah. It can also do that purpose as well. So you could do it at the beginning of the class. So here was an example um, that I did with a class. Oh, it was a great five class. I think it was two weeks ago. Uh, in your journal, estimate how many sugar cubes are in the container. Explain how you estimate it using words and or pictures. So here was the example. Here was um, one of the students. Today we estimated how many candies were in a jar. On each side had about 30 times 4, and then it has sides. That would make 120. On the bottom we had about 30, and 120 plus 30 is 150. In the middle there are about 30. 30 plus 150 is 80. Did you say they have estimation? What grade is this? Grade 5. Would you score that as a 2 or 1 or 0? It's a 2. Because you were grade 2, right? So, that's good. You know, I don't know. I'd say one, because they haven't really explained how they estimated. Yep. Like how they decided. And do you think you need to know what lot. you're actually testing here? Like what the question is, like what achievement indicator that you're trying to target? <clears throat> I, we had a big debate about this. I scored it as a one. The teacher wanted to score it as a two, because this was the best journal entry that the student has done to date sort of thing. And you have to also know your students and what their capabilities are. I thought it was pretty good though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. October. So I already showed you um, this, but this is called an evidence wall, and here's a picture. This is, um, I think this is this is an old one, and um, teachers are doing this as a form of ass assessment. Be formative. It's, it could also be summative so to a certain extent. What they're doing is once they've achieved an outcome or they're working on a learning outcome. They have like something like this, where they can put it up on a wall, which is with just folders, and you put activities for N1 in there, so they can go and the, the activities can come from your achievement indicators that are on the portal, all the questions that are on the portal for the grade levels. The only two grade levels that don't have it right now are grade one and grade two, but this year they'll they'll be there soon. They're we're working on them right now. Um, Achievement indicators, numeracy nets, different questions that you create. If you find them in a book, you find them in math, makes sense. And what the students can do is they can go up and they can pick a question from the evidence wall. They take the sheet, they work on it, and then they put it in their portfolio. And that's an, that's an indication as to whether or not they're achieving that outcome or not. So it seems like a lot of work to get all those activities for those outcomes. But if you start at the beginning of the year and you're following your long-term planning documents for grades 3, 4, and 5, um, K2 does not have a long-term planning document, but if you're following it and you're making up those activities, 
So when you're going and you're doing your guided math lessons and you're doing your differentiated learning, you can have students working on some activities from the evidence wall to gather for your assessment. While you're working with a small group, other students can be doing math games or different activities. But it's a really neat thing because it's always being able to go back and looking at those outcomes that have already been taught and going back and make sure that they're still retaining that information. Does that make sense? Yeah. So could it be act, like activities or game? Like, does it have to be question? Like, activities, games, or questions, or both? Or um, I wouldn't put I wouldn't put games okay. there. I would just put like some sort of like an assessment to see if they understand one of the achievement indicators of one of the learning outcomes for that outcome. I wouldn't put any games in there because you want it to be like some sort of assessment where they're where you're gathering information to see if they understand it or not. Is this something that the kids take ownership of and they're self-motivated to do, or is this something you direct them to? Well, when I did it with grade five, I did it with, uh, when I was a math coach, I did it with the grade fives at Military North. We would do it every Friday or Thursday, depending upon where we were with our lessons. They would have to pick at least two items from the evidence wall, and they'd, they'd be responsible for putting it in their portfolio. Now, sometimes when we look through their portfolios, we find that they're a little N3 heavy, that they kind of like those activities. So we would go to the students and say, why don't you try to do an SS2 activity, or why don't you try to do a PR1 activity. And then that day, we would meet with our small groups of students and try to work with, with the misconceptions that are going on with our, with our learners. So they're working on the evidence wall. We have some other activities set up for them once they've finished their evidence wall. But you need that time as teachers to kind of work with your small groups, but you're also gathering formative assessment on the other students while they're waiting for their time. It takes a lot of time to set up, and it takes a lot of work to get, like, it takes work to get the students used to evidence walls. But I'm just throwing this out here for you guys just to think about. It's just an option. It works for some. It doesn't work for others. Um, we borrowed this from Fredericton. Some of the teachers in Fredericton are doing this, and they're finding a lot of success with it. I know a middle school here in our city is using it. It might be, maybe it's more appropriate for them, but I found it worked at the grade five level. I'm kind of hesitant to see if it would work at a K to two level. Maybe later on in the school year it might for, for them, but it's really efficient. So if you're interested more in evidence walls, you can sit down and talk and I can show you some examples and, and bring you over lots of stuff that um, Amy's doing. Um, if you're using that as evidence and they're putting it in their portfolio, um, where does the assessment of how they did on that, is that self-assessment that they're doing? Is that teacher assessment? It's assessment that when they have it in their portfolios, I'm not quite sure what you mean. When they put it in their portfolio, I would take a look at it and the teacher would take a look at it and, and kind of assess it. So it's teacher there. assessment, so you'll yeah, have to go through all the portfolios. Yeah, okay. going through the portfolios. And it's not like... It's not, it's as much work as you, you want it to be, I guess. Does that make sense? So when, when would you do this? In what part of your lesson would you? We started it right in September. We started it right in September, and I know Amy's doing it right now. And she has, so she's a grade four teacher. And with her outcomes that she's already worked on in September, She's already gone through her new missing nets, and she's gone through and taken those activities out. She's put them in the folders. She's gone through, um, what other resources did she use? She made some open-ended journal questions. She found a couple of constructive response questions and some real problems pertaining to them. She put them in those folders already, and so there's a bank of questions that are in there. So when she's meeting, I think she does it on Thursdays, she gets the students to go and pick two activities from the evidence wall and put it in their portfolio. Yeah, the thing with the portfolios is that <coughs> students know that it's portfolio work and it's something that their parents are going to see in November, so they, they try to do their best and they show as much as they can. And she likes it because this is what, instead of leafing through a math notebook, everything's in here to show to the teacher, or to show to the parent or the parent teacher what their strengths and weaknesses are. So I guess my question is though, like when during the lesson, like is this, would this be? This could be a math class. This would be a class. During the math class. Okay, okay, so this is, all right. And that's, I guess, my question, like, do you give them time to work on that during class? Yep. Like, say if you're doing, say if you're doing a day where they're doing games and activities and you're doing reinforcing concepts and you want to meet with groups of students, this is a great thing to do. Uh, it could be just a group. I used to do Sunny or something. 
Right. This is just the subcomponent. That's right. You could use that as a component of centers, right? Mm -hmm. So you could have your got it not going on, they could be working on games, and one of the centers could be your other one as well. Yeah, that's a good way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just food for thought. <laughs> And there's a picture of the portfolios. That's how one of the teachers stores her portfolio, so the students are responsible for putting it on the shelf. She'd be really embarrassed if I <laughs> if she saw that big mess at the top, but it's pretty authentic. So I think this is what Joanne was talking about earlier with observations. This is a really neat um, observation sheet that you can just put whatever outcome you're working on. So say if you're working on SS1, and you can put the outcome there. And then this could be used for a whole week. And if you had your student's name right here, and you use this, and you notice something about Billy that he's really understanding such and such, you make a comment. But if you use this for a weekly format, you could see, have you assessed each one of your students, you know, in, kind of informally, or to go around and see what they're learning. Have you gone and you checked on your student? Because I'm guilty of this. I always answer the same hands sometimes, and I don't get to see every student. But if you have a sheet like this for every week, and you make a little comment about each student, then you're mindful of where they are in their learning. And it's just one sheet. It's not sticky notes. You're not going to lose it. And it's just something easy to do. Is there a, do you have a sample of that that you can email? It's on the yeah. portal. Oh, it is on the it's portal? It's on the portal. Where? But it's, I think it's under teacher resources. But our portal is a little under under construction. So what I can do is I have a distribution list, and I can send that out to all of you. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, it works really well because then you're really mindful of what students you haven't really assessed or not. So what else you can do is just have like a green a green marker and a red marker, and every time a kid gets the concept, you put you know trace their square in green, and at the end of the week, you've kind of got a snapshot of where your class is too. That's a great way to do it too. And you could also, if you want it to be even friendly, you can put it like in a pocket and then just keep changing it out every week kind of thing if you didn't want to keep it for week to week. Yeah, yeah, it works. A lot of teachers find success with that. I have a different form. Can I just go in and grab it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, Joanne's going to get that. Um, one of the big things is oral assessments and conferencing. Um, my little guy started kindergarten this year, and he got his first little math assessment that came home, so I was all excited to see it, wanted to know what was going on. It was really neat. She did an oral pattern assessment with them, and he was, it was, she had every question, and he had a circle and do this, and it was really, really neat, and there was a picture of him having his assessment done, and she had it attached, so I thought that was really neat. So, it's just like guided reading, really, guided math. So we just kind of have to get into that habit when we're in the math class to kind of have those guided math sessions with our small groups using our guided reading tables, not just for literacy, but for math as well. Okay. 